Close encounters with rarities found nowhere else in the Philippines await the traveler to Palawan. And the question, how did this get here, can lead the curious to a first-rate tale millions of years old. It begins with a geologist poking for clues in the rocks. This rock is igneous, born from the fires of volcanism. This is sedimentary, made of particles carried by wind, river, or glacier. They tell the story of the slow motion birth of Palawan, with tectonic plates carrying oceans and land masses on their backs as they danced on the mantle of magma beneath the Earth's crust. Geology says that like neighboring Borneo and Malaysia, Palawan and the Calamian Islands were part of the Asian mainland 35 to 55 million years ago. Through millennia of dramatic upheaval, with earthquakes and volcanoes rising out of the sea as tectonic plates rubbed, collided, and plunged under one another, the slow eastward drift of the Eurasian plate carrying the Asian mainland towards the Philippine mobile belt slowly pushed what became Palawan to its present location on the archipelago's westernmost frontier. If geography is destiny, Palawan and its satellite islands were destined to become bridges to many worlds, beginning with that time before written record known as prehistory. In 1962, in this magnificent complex of limestone caves lapped by the South China Sea and named after the Tabon bird which had been laying its eggs deep in many layers of guano for a very long time, fragments of the skull cap, jaw and teeth of three prehistoric humans began turning up under the spade of a National Museum team led by the late anthropologist Dr. Robert Fox. The earliest known Homo sapiens yet found in the country, modern testing methods have since redated these fossils to 16,000 years old, still well within the range of the last ice age. This is the first thinking man uh, that has evolved in our country, in the Philippines. So it's quite significant. There were forms of archaic Homo sapiens, which were morphologically different looking than what we see from the fossils of the modern man. But the archaic man, or Homo sapiens, is more massive in terms of the uh, bone structure. And there is older fossil evidence in Southeast Asia called the Homo erectus. This is the very famous Java man or the Peking man between Asia, Europe, Africa, and of course Southeast Asia. There is this wide distribution of this archaic form and the uh, Homo erectus 300,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago for the age of the Homo erectus, up to about 1.2 million years ago. So that's a very long process of evolution. Here in our country, a uh, thinking man can be compared to the evolution of the thinking man in Europe. After the Neanderthal, you have the Cro-Magnon. And these are the people who produce paintings in their caves. Along with the human fossils found a few years earlier in the Nia caves of Sarawak, Borneo, 600 kilometers southwest, Tabon Man, who turned out to have been a woman, became a major link in a growing chain of scholarship on the age, origins, dispersal, and evolution of the Southeast Asian and Pacific peoples. The Tabon Caves themselves became a bridge to better understanding the evolution of the Earth itself. Palawan, said the geologist, was born in fire but grew older in ice. In that era called Pleistocene, when the Earth underwent four ice ages two million to ten thousand years ago. In the fourth and last ice age, waters evaporated and froze into ice sheets and glaciers 
on mountain tops and around the North Pole, causing global sea levels to recede by a hundred meters. It was then that Palawan's most dramatic bridge emerged, the Sunda Shelf, connecting it to the Malay Peninsula, Java, Sumatra, and Borneo. Through land bridges connecting 1.8 million square kilometers, collectively called Sunda Land, man, beast, and plants traveled back and forth for tens of thousands of years. That's why they called uh, Palawan as a very unique ecosystem and habitat because uh, here you'll find uh, uh, the type of fauna population that you cannot find uh, anywhere else in the Philippines. These are mostly uh, associated with uh, the Borneo type of fauna uh, population rather than uh, what you can find in uh, the other parts of the Philippines. Nature and culture, geology and archaeology, with their related sciences, joined hands in the Tabon Caves. There, the National Museum began to uncover fascinating bits and pieces of the grand story still unfolding today. From depths ranging from 25 to 160 centimeters, dug in the 60s and 70s, a picture of prehistory slowly emerged, gaining detail with each new centimeter dug in Tabon, neighboring caves, and the rest of Palawan. Stones with sharp edges, flake tools, the archaeologists call them, was the material most widely found in the upper excavation layers. They were of chert, a kind of quartz resembling flint, widely found in Palawan's riverbeds. Having helped early man gradually master his environment, they became a new set of clues to how closely the geologists placed the scene or ice age had coincided with the archaeologists' Paleolithic or Old Stone Age and Early Neolithic or New Stone Age. As the digging went deeper, more stone tools, older and less refined, emerged. The conclusion was inevitable. Man was becoming smarter with the passing of time. Dr. Fox mused that the later tools must have been maintenance tools for making wooden and bamboo implements for hunting and trapping. Indeed, found with them were evidence of ancient cooking fires and the bones of birds and bats, wild pig and a tiny deer already extinct for 4,000 years but possibly related to the present-day Calamian deer. The initial finds were exciting, but brought a major mystery. With the sea just below the caves, why was not a single seashell found in six different sites of human habitation whose ages range from 8,500 to 50,000 years old? Other caves with flake tools 7,000 years old had already yielded thousands of seashells elsewhere. This question led to the next Eureka. The Tabun Caves must have been inhabited in the last Ice Age, when the Sunda Shelf was exposed and the seashore lay 35 kilometers away. In time, 20,000 land and marine shells did turn up in a back chamber of Guri Cave, northeast of Lipuun Point, dated at 4,000 to 6,000 BC. Early post-Pleistocene, the geologists said, the end of the last Ice Age. That was around 8,000 years ago, when massive melting ice had swelled the seas and gradually inundated the land bridges, bringing the shore to where it lies today. That melting ice had set the stage for radical global changes scholars would call the Neolithic Revolution. During the Neolithic, since the sea rose and the islands are separated, the only way that people could move from one place to the other is by means of boat. What happened then is a tremendous change in the culture of people, not only in the islands but also in uh, the mainland. During this period, there is a change in the tool technology. If you look at Tabon Caves, most of the tools there are primary flakes, uh, very little of edge uh, retouching. 
later on, uh, another cave in Lipon Point, which is lower uh, uh, towards the northeast, uh, called Guri Cave, you find now tools that are being retouched. So there's tremendous amount of reworking of tools, which later on developed into the orientation of the cutting edge of the stone tool towards one end. And from this they move into what's known as the edge ground tool. So you have a naturally occurring stone taken from the riverbed probably that's elongated. And what people do is they chip one end and then grind it. That's why it's known as edge ground tool. This is the precursor of the later, later edges. And this is also found in uh, many caves in Palawan. From the edge ground tool uh, developed first what's known as the rectangular adze. So what they did with the edge ground tool is they polished all the sides now so that it becomes smooth and tabular in fact. Then further development of this tool is became quadrangular in cross section and some stepping at the butt end to which they then added handles. Then you have what's known as the adze now. Now the adze is developed into gouges also with a rounded like a rounded chisel, half moon chisel, and with this you can really gouge out the trunks of trees to produce boats. With the movement of uh, boats, uh, you'll have more contact between people. During this time, a new group of people coming from South Asia and along the coast of uh, eastern coast of the mainland Asia. It's a movement of people who are speaking the Austronesian family of languages. They are associated with the appearance of the tools and other forms of uh, subsistence like agriculture, domestication of plants and animals. There are two, basically two, uh, hypotheses regarding this. One is called the mainland Austronesian Hello. hypothesis and the island Austronesian hypothesis by uh, Wilhelm Solheim. The mainland hypothesis says that, well, uh, Austronesian-speaking people started in mainland Southeast Asia, dispersed through the Philippines, Madagascar to the west, and as far as Easter Island uh, in the Polynesian group of islands. Solheim, Bill Solheim, uh, depicts Indonesia and Mindanao as the homeland, as the homeland of the Austronesian speaking people. Look at the boat making and boat making evidence. You have the Balangay, uh, dated to what, 300 AD. And then in Indonesia, you have evidences also of uh, early signs of boat making. The, the people that were living uh, in Taban Cave to begin with and the other caves. Uh, were already uh, adept at moving around on the ocean. So our supposition is uh, that these were probably some sort of sailing rafts, not boats, but that uh, they possibly had a centerboard so that they were able to guide them a bit. Uh, they'd mostly go with the currents, with the tides and the currents. This is a big puzzle, taking its shape slowly, yes. Uh, very, in, very intriguing, very exciting puzzle that will resolve the story of Southeast Asia as a very important area of the development of, uh, of man and his culture. All of the languages in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Madagascar, in Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia, the groups in Taiwan, the indigenous groups there, uh, some portions also of New Guinea, belong to the Austronesian group of family of languages. So this is an area covered by almost one third of the, of the planet. And uh, the number of Austronesian speakers uh, used to be the Malayo-Polynesian group of uh, languages. The number of speakers are the most numerous on, on Earth today, about 270 million. So linguists have been working on this on how they disperse through the science of linguistics. Now, not far behind is archaeology. People or archaeologists working in the area have been uh, seeing movements of people through chronology, through the dates of pottery, uh, dates of stone tools, 
and seeing that there are sequences in the movement of uh, people in the Southeast Asian uh, area. So they have early age uh, in the Philippines and Indonesia and younger age in the Polynesian, Micronesian and Melanesian Islands. The beauty of the pottery in, in Tabun Cave is that it explained the movement of populations uh, in contrast to what was postulated by uh, the late uh, Dr. H. Otley Bayer, uh, who theorized that the movement of the burial jar complex in the Philippines came from the north, from South China, moving around the eastern side of the Philippines down to the Bicol regions, and from there it turned uh, westward, reaching Palawan. But indications in the Palawan burial is that the affinity seems to be uh, from the southwest, coming from Borneo. The jar burials start showing up uh, earlier to the north uh, along the coast, uh, maybe as early as 1500 BC at, in the El Nido area, uh, a little later down there in around Taban, and in uh, Nia Cave, uh, Vietnam, more in the southern part of Vietnam. Uh, it's more of the southern, the southern half of Vietnam that, that's related directly to Palawan uh, and probably from Palawan around into the Visayan Islands. I saw some very close similarities between pottery at one of the first sites I excavated in the Philippines starting in 1951, again in 1953 in Maspati. Some pottery that, that Bayer, who was uh, certainly the expert on Philippine archaeology at that time didn't know. He hadn't seen it before. I was uh, in Sarawak for about a year with the Fulbright Fellowship when I first went there. Uh, here was the potter from Dia Cave. was very similar pottery. And I visited uh, museums in Singapore, in Bangkok, in Phnom Penh, in Laos, and in Bangkok. They had a big, beautiful museum, an old palace, and one small room with prehistoric material in it. Here were about five earthenware vessels that could have perfectly well come from this site in Maspati that I'd excavated. And I got very excited about it. If any of those vessels at this site on the western part of Thailand on the peninsula had been found in uh, Kalanai Cave site in Maspati, uh, no problem. They were they just fit in perfectly. The clay, the temper, the the forms, the decoration, everything. It looked like exactly the same people. But this was what um, probably over 2,000 kilometers away. I thought at first of a single culture uh, that was over, but it was in such a wide area. No one culture uh, at that time, at least, uh, could have spread anywhere near that far. But obviously, some way or another, they were in contact and there were just more and more indication of maritime contact over a wider and wider area. Knowing nothing about their expansive ocean-going past, the first Westerner to record meeting the Batak, the smallest of Palawan's main indigenous tribes, found them isolated at the center of the main island's mountain fastnesses. The Spanish chronicler Venturello wrote that this nomadic people were incredibly skilled with bows and arrows, living by wit and speed as they hunted wild boar and squirrel and gathered roots, fruits, and honey for food. Linguists, archaeologists, and anthropologists have since discovered that this tribe belongs to Palawans, indeed the Philippines' most ancient people, the tribe to which Tabon woman must have belonged. They are the descendants of a former uh, group of people uh, in earlier times who spoke a proto austronesian language. In the time of their prehistoric ancestors, many Batak children were named after animals, trees, rivers, and places of their birth. Much time has passed since then. Yung pamangking ko, nandiyan, buhay pa rin ngayon. Yung pamangking ko, si Balayang. Kasi pag-anak ng nanay niya, doon sa punong nang saging na Balayang ang saging. 
Apa namin? Ang pangalan. Saba. Ayun na siguro ang talagang kahit anong anak buhay namin, katulad na yung mga baboy, kung mag panlagay kami ng mga silo namin sa baboy, wala na kasi siguro nagtampo na yung diwata na bawat makakuha kami ng baboy, pinapabili lang, hindi ni kinakain. Ay noon, yung doon pa kami sa mauyon, bawat may makakuha ng baboy, pinaparti-parti sa lahat na bahay. Walang pinagpabili. Kaya araw-araw ang baboy ay ngayon, makakuha ka ng baboy. Hindi ito sa mga kristyano. Pabili. May iwan sa iyo. Ulo. Ngayon, nagagalit ang diwata. Ngayon pala, hindi ninyo kinakain. Hindi ngayon, pending na. Kaya yun, siguro talagang kasalanan namin sa <laughs> diwata. Back then, it was indeed an incredibly rich world to name one's progeny by, with ancient lowland, new and old limestone, and mangrove forests teeming with unique flora and fauna long before cash value was attached to them. Diptyrocarp uh, forest is the most important uh, commercial forest that we have in the Philippines and uh, also the most important uh, in Palawan. This is uh, traditionally the main source of uh, uh, diptyrocarp species of which uh, we have in the Philippines about uh, 45 in number. In trees alone, uh, there are more than uh, 3,500 recorded. And in Palawan, the uh, dominating uh, tree species there is structure number to about uh, 300. This is the richest in terms of biodiversity, both for ecosystem and uh, species biodiversity, meaning uh, this serves as habitat for most of the, uh, not only a wide range of flora, but uh, also fauna. This by and large support the uh, habitat of one of the most unique uh, fauna population found in the Philippines. In CART's uh, uh, geologic formation, what predominates mostly a uh, different type of butterflies and insects, and possibly you can find highest type of biodiversity among this type. In Palawan, you have 42% of the mangroves of the whole of the Philippines. Ulugan Bay, which is a very small part of Puerto Princesa, harbors 15% of the country's mangroves and 50% of the mangroves of Palawan. But the wealth of Palawan's surface is a mere hint of its underwater riches. It's like uh, going down to another world. For example, in areas where you have some slight current, you find so many colorful different forms of soft corals. Soft corals are just teeming. And then you come up to a certain ledge where you have hard corals, but these are now of these uh, tabular forms, branching forms. In some silted areas where visibility is a bit limited, then you come up with these round forms, the massive forms. And with these forms, you have also different schools of fish, organisms, and even attached seaweeds of different colors. You see fish and even anemones and slugs especially, slugs of different colors and shapes that graze, that play with each other, that help each other. Highest diversity in the world is now known to be in the Indo-West Pacific, and the Philippines is very much in the center of it. When I say biodiversity, we are looking at uh, practically all groups of plants and animals. Mangroves, coral reefs, seagrass beds, we are at the center of the highest genetic richness in the world. How come biodiversity is so high in a place? Geologically, we have this uh, ring of fire. The ring of fire is just a ring of volcanoes all around the rim of the Pacific. Volcanoes are the main source of nutrients and heat. We speak also of 
warmth and moisture which is now being provided by the Tibetan forest, the green belt that runs from China down to the Malay Peninsula, Papua New Guinea, which runs to the Philippines. So all those physical, chemical requirements set the stage for very high speciation and endemism. Many species interact with each other to give rise to a very diverse gene pool. By the time the Spaniards came, slave raiding tribes from the Muslim South had driven many Batak, Tagbanwa, and Palawan settlements from the foothills to the mountains and deeper into the forest. Tribal oral tradition, however, remembers the time when their ancestors were intimate with the riches of Palawan's coastal waters. The Spaniards also found the Batak planting yams and rice in Sweden's or Kaingin's. It has taken today's environmental crises to birth a new appreciation for the wisdom of tribal agriculture. Sweetening in the south, in Palawan, had to do with harvesting forest and beginning from uh, root crops. They slowly cultivated small patches of land in what is known as the checkerboard technique. So little plots planted to uh, different kinds of plants. The te technique that they use here is the so-called harvestable forest. If you will compare this with intensive uh, wet rice cultivation, uh, this modern type is a, what you call, a monocropping uh, technology. But Sweden cultivators usually plant a huge, uh, a very broad spectrum of plants. Spectrum approach. If a pest will hit one crop, they still have many more to fall on. And these plants mature at different times of the year. So throughout the year, they have things to harvest apart from the uh, main crop. Given a good Sweden, they can subsist on its production for two years. But in a rice uh, pr production, they'll only have enough rice for a year. Intensive rice cultivation expends seven times more energy than the energy spent in planting an equal amount of field into Sweden. That's why the uh, traditional peoples prefer to do it. Unlike the Tagbanwa and Palawan tribes, however, the Batak were less exposed to the ways of the aliens who had come by sea. Before the Spaniards came, these neighbors became the Batak's bridges to the outside world, all of them exchanging Palawan's natural wealth for the wealth of many civilizations. Nature's heirlooms became tribal currency, the almasiga resin, beeswax and honey, the swiftlet's nest, that prized delicacy of bird saliva and seawater, and rice bartered for porcelain plates and pottery, bronze trays, boxes, gongs and weapons, cloth, beads and ornaments from shores near and far. These became the tribe's own revered pusaka, heirlooms handed down through generations, used in sacred rituals and buried with the dead to accompany their voyage to the next world. Palawan's tribal heirlooms are eloquent proof of a proto-history livened by maritime trade that linked the Philippines to the wide worlds of the Pacific, Asia, and beyond. This idea of a maritime culture without planning uh, of relatively short uh, traditional routes that intersected with others so that material from here would get over to Vietnam, go to Thailand, uh, and maybe in the process of getting to, uh, to India or material from India coming here. It seems that the Philippines was central to this system from Oh, in the neighborhood, maybe as early as 2000 BC, in other words, 4,000 years ago, until two or 300 AD, 
when actual commercial planning started taking off in movement of trade from India uh, around to South China. And then the, the boats became bigger, the cargoes became bigger, the sailors and the boats involved in this trade, oh, up until a thousand, a thousand years ago, were Southeast Asian. Weather was vital to this maritime network. Sudden typhoons over uncharted atolls and coral reefs have left rich traces of proto-historic trade from many shipwrecked foreign vessels in Palawan waters. The earliest uh, evidence of shipwreck we have from Palawan is uh, the investigator show, which is 11th century to 12th century, at least during the Song Dynasty uh, AD. And so from then on, we observe more shipwrecks, uh, mid 14th century, 15th century, 16th century, up, even up to the 19th centuries. So it means that the waters of Palawan, including the archipelagic water of the Philippines, has been very active for maritime trade and uh, shipping industry from this period on. The best higher quality uh, of porcelain, which are comparable to the collection of Tokapi Museum, some museums in London. The collections we now have, for example, in the uh, like uh, mid-16th century, uh, at present may be far greater than uh, what other museums would have as a whole. Beyond material objects, however, were the cultural riches that entered Palawan through maritime trade like this extant syllabary related to Sanskrit. A variant of similar syllabaries found all over Southeast Asia, it is still used by today's older Tagbanwa for messages and signing official documents. They were the only tribe using it in Palawan until they taught it to the Palawan tribe before World War II. Today, Palawan tribes use Surat Tagbanwa to write formal community notices called tuturan. Most likely brought by merchants on the trading ships, with this syllabary came foreign spiritual traditions that blended seamlessly with the most ancient rituals with which Palawan's tribes have wooed, placated, and given thanks to nature and their ancestral spirits to this day. Like the Hindu, the Batak and Tagbanwa believe that human beings have several souls. The Palawan tribe of Southern Palawan, meanwhile, believes in a seven-layered heaven, echoing the Hindus' own concept of the here and after. They meet in the constantly surprising world of nature, which, beyond sustaining physical life, inspires art and culture's dreams of beauty and meaning. The forest is a wonderfully luxurious universe. Men cross its rivers carrying long bladed knives, blowguns and quivers. Women cross with baskets and cut bladed knives. Little girls accompany their mothers or may stay at home to care for the little ones. The boys accompany their fathers or more often form gangs of two, three or four little friends to watch over the fields to protect them from birds as the rice matures. They hunt, fish, and picnic beside the river, or they'll fly their kites in the felling season when the winds are light and warm. It is in this universe of great trees in which live so many birds and insects, flying squirrels, civets, anteater, giant lizard, monkeys, and in the night, owls and bats 
that the Palawan grows up with, his life filled with the rustling, cheering, buzzing, whispering, whistling, murmuring, and singing of nature. Only the women dance the tara. It is a percussion dance. Their heels is sounding on the bamboo floor, accompanied by a light swinging of their arms held straight beside their bodies. In a movement from back to front, they wave little brooms of folded leaves called silad. The men sing the Tarangat Siburang, or jar songs. It expresses courtesy and respect, the invitation to drink, and invokes the presence of the master of the rice and the delicacies contained in the jar of rice wine with exquisite emanations. And the orchestra of gongs keeps on playing until dawn. 